Here we go. And I'm so excited to uh, be able to have the ULVLC co-sponsor this conversation today. I've been really looking forward to seeing Natalie again, even from, from screen to screen. Um, and I am gonna turn it over to the Library Diversity Committee to get us going. Okay, thank you very much, Jenny. And true, I, I get the opportunity to introduce Natalie. Um, today we have Natalie Blass, who is the Collection Development Librarian at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. She was formerly the Business Librarian at that same school from 2014 to 2021. Her interest includes mentorship, issues of equity and access in libraries, and women in leadership. Natalie began her career as the diversity resident librarian here from 2012 to 2014. During her residency, the rotations, the first year, ROI, technical services and cataloging, special collections and university archives. Her final year, she focused on, she was in the reference area, ROI, and focused on business librarianship. In addition, Natalie served on the Library Diversity Committee. She was a member of Alianza on campus committee, and that's a committee supporting Latino issues in higher education oh, yeah. and was a SOAR coordinator. She was very active in the Alianza Executive Committee by participating in the UNC, UNC University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Hispanic Faculty Forum, diversity events, and high school college fairs. Natalie was selected to participate in the 2014 ALA Emerging Leaders Program, and her participation was sponsored by ACRL University Library. So we'll give a warm Zoom welcome to Natalie. Thank you for joining us today. And the first thing I wanna do as far as leading off, and true, Natalie does have some pictures she'll show a little bit later, but when Natalie started here as a resident, she actually started in September and she actually graduated from Florida State University's library school in September. And basically, as soon as she got here, probably didn't get a chance to get comfortable or anything because we had her packing bags to join us at the Joint Conference of Librarians of Color, which was in Kansas City. And I tell you, we really made a big impact at that conference. We had about 22 people from UNC Greensboro. So of course that included our ACE scholars and we had 16 students who actually presented at the, JCL, the JCLC conference. So true, you're gonna see a picture where for the first time um, she had a chance to meet Letitia and Jason because everybody was there, um, University of Illinois where Letitia was working on her PhD, sent her to be at the Illinois booth, and then University of South Carolina, where Jason was working on his PhD, they sent him to, and he had a presentation there. So it was wonderful, of course, for me to see all three former residents there. And um, like I said, um, the ACE scholars, they all knew Jason, they all knew Letitia, and then they got a chance to meet Natalie. And of course, she was kind of like a mentor for them while they were finishing the program. And of course, um, Dr. Chu and Roseanne actually um, attended that conference. Like I said, everybody at that conference knew that UNC Greensboro was there. And so definitely, I have that wonderful memory. Um, so now I'll lead to our first question for Natalie. Can you talk about what attracted you to work in, Loy in the library at Loyola University. Sure, thank you for the introduction, Gerald, and hi to everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. There's definitely some new names, um, uh, new folks that I didn't have the chance to meet during my time at UNCG, but there's also plenty of people that I recognize and I'm so excited to be here with, with you all. So thank you for, for inviting me and I will eventually have to take a visit back to Greensboro and and visit you all in person. Um, but, but getting to your question, Gerald, about what attracted me to, to LMU. Um, so I, I knew um, 
many years and, and going into UNCG that I was interested in reference and instruction and that I was interested in academic libraries. Um, but towards the end at FSU, I had a mentor say, hey, um, would you be interested in business librarianship? I was actually paired with him, with the business librarian at FSU. He says, you seem to have a knack for it. It could be a good career path for you. You know, do you want to explore it? And I said, yeah, sure. And then as I moved into UNCG, um, Steve really took me under his wing as well. And we'll, I can talk more about that um, uh, later. Um, so, so slowly but surely, I kind of started pursuing a career in business librarianship. And one thing that attracted me about LMU specifically is that in the job description, it was um, phrased very much for entry level. I had gotten interviews for other business librarian positions and they seemed to want someone with a little bit more experience, even though I had had two mentors and had some experience, I hadn't fully been a business librarian yet. And I was really grateful when I read the, the job description at LMU because it seemed like a good way to get my foot in the door, specifically with business librarianship. And um, another thing that attracted me to LMU is its Jesuit mission, it's a Jesuit Catholic university. Um, and they, the whole thing here is on um, the education of the whole person. So it's really thinking of how we engage with our students and put them out into the world to be thoughtful um, individual. So I, I really enjoyed that, that part of the mission. And, um, and to this day, I, I see how various departments, um, including the library, work with that mission in our strategic goals. So I, I really enjoyed that part of LMU as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Second question. Can you talk about your work at the library there at Loyola, as well as maybe on campus committees, things like that? Sure. Um, so as, as you had mentioned uh, previously, when I left UNCG, I accepted the job as the business librarian um, at LMU. And that's been the position that I've been doing the longest. I was in that position for seven years. Um, and very similar to Steve's um, uh, position at UNCG, I was a direct liaison for the College of Business, which included providing reference to business students and faculty, instruction sessions, outreach, collection development. Um, and, and recently, uh, within the last few months, uh, the collection development librarian position opened. Um, she is now our associate dean, so she, she got promoted. Um, and, and I was approached and, and asked, would I be interested in this internal position, which would then move me into a broader, um, in a position where um, I would work with all departments across campus and then work in, in the collection development policies and procedures at, with the whole library. Um, so it was definitely a difficult decision to make that transition, but it was such a good opportunity for me to grow and expand my skills. So I took it. Um, I've been in this new position uh, just for three months, so I'm still, I'm still learning. And I even thought I need to reach out to someone at UNCG that does collection development so we can chat and just talk about collection development in general. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so um, in, in terms of, of committees, we always laugh in our, in our reference department because we say we've just about been in every committee under the sun. We're a very, we're a smaller library. Um, and so we tend to be very active in committees and rotate through, through them as well. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, Natalie, um, and kind of pivot a little bit to your time at UNC. So I just came in 2017, so I didn't get a chance to meet you when you were here. Um, but could you, would you mind sharing a little bit about some of the projects that you did and resources that you worked on at UNCG during your first year as the resident? Of course. Um, and as Gerald mentioned, um, in my first year, I rotated in reference and instruction, which I have learned is now or, um, ROI. <laughs> That's new branding for you all. It was different when I was here. And then I also did technical services. Um, and then I think with the focus in cataloging. 
and then special collections and university archives. So that was that was my my first year. Um, and I do feel that, you know, reference and instruction was my bread and butter. I was really happy to start there um, during my first rotation because I had had experience at Florida State doing that. But I do have a confession. Um, I will never volunteer to lead an instruction session at Florida State because I was so shy and not willing to do it. And at UNCG, you all were like, uh-uh, you're going to shadow, we're going to help you. But, you know, if you want to be a reference and instruction librarian, you have to teach. And so I was definitely pushed um, very carefully. I wasn't just, you know, pushed on the deep end. And so I really appreciate that. So Jenny and Amy, I don't think I've ever confessed that to you all because I came in very confident I can do this. But um, I got a lot of support, especially in instruction during my rotation and reference. So doing things such as working on the desk. Um, I believe it was English 101, Jenny. I might be misremembering um, that massive instructions um, uh, courses that, that you all lead. And then working with the A scholars and the, and the MLIS students. So that was a lot of fun. And it was really great to get started in somewhere that I felt you know, really comfortable and really happy. Um, and then I moved on to technical services. And due to my track in library school, like a cataloging class was recommended, but it was never required. So I managed to graduate with, that, with like no cataloging course. And so I want to do like a shout out to both um, to Callie and Anna because they really trained me like this is what cataloging is and this is how you do it. Um, so it may seem very entry level for some folks, but for me, like I had I had no formal training prior to the rotation. It really helped me, I think, become a better reference librarian because I under I understood now how the back end works. Um, so I was able to do some copy cataloging and then working closely with Anna. Um, to upload some thesis to NC Docs. Um, and so that was also, again, kind of my first introduction to what is a repository, um, you know, and again, the back end, what does it mean to add these or upload these and, you know, in a meaningful way that will help with access on the front end. Um, and I don't think he's here, but we, I always enjoy the birthday parties and technical services and we would have Wisconsin cheese. So that's like a fond memory I have of my rotation in technical services. Um, and then moving on to special collections and university archives, again, like due to my track in library school, again, always focusing on reference, I had no archives or special collections course. So this was again, like a brand new introduction to to, to the area. And so I was able to staff the desk in special collections or SCUA. Um, I shadowed instruction sessions. And in this sense, how do you incorporate primary sources in your teaching? Um, and then I also processed um, a collection of paper from the Women and Gender Studies. And um, that was all brand new and really exciting. Um, and so at the end of year one, I really got to see how all the different, the, well, there were more departments, but I got a better understanding of how various departments within an academic library work. I had always been so focused in reference and instruction. So it was extremely, um, such a great learning experience. And I will tell people over and over, a great thing about a residency is that you have this one year to explore and really work on things outside of your comfort level. Um, if you take another job, um, you know, that is not a residency, you have a pretty set list of responsibilities and that's what you do. Um, but a great thing about a residency is that you really get to um, experience new things. Even if you don't pursue that later as a career path, I still am so thankful for technical services and special collections. Um, I mean, they're really, they were really great experiences. It sounds really great. It also sounds like you were really appreciated here. I don't know if you saw the chat. Amy said you were lovingly encouraged to do those instruction <laughs> sessions. And Jenny said you were great. And Anna said you did gr a great job in cataloging. They were all very glad to work with you. Thank you. So could you tell us a little bit about some of the projects and resources you worked on during the second year you were with us? Sure. Um, I will say one of the thing about residency, though, is you have to be a good project manager or be able to juggle multiple things at one time. So starting 
the year, yeah, like year one, I started gathering, um, you know, going through my rotations, but also being on committees and trying to create my own initiatives. And so, you know, it year two, it started to be like, okay, what do I want to focus on? And it, and it, it was difficult to choose one thing, but in the end, um, I was getting pretty serious about pursuing business librarianship. So I did, um, I did pair up with Steve Kramer and was co-liaison um, of the Bryan School of Business. And I would um, shadow um, research consultation, shadow instruction. And eventually I was given, um, I was embedded in Campus Entrepreneurs, which was a course in the business school. Um, I did my own research consultations. Um, so really, and even I think a collection development project under business. Um, so really everything that I needed, all the tools and skills to, to be a business librarian, um, I focus on that on year two. Gerald had also mentioned Alianza UNCG. Um, at that time, that was just starting. That group was just forming back in 2013. I think it kind of um, was a situation where I was, I was lucky. I was there. I was able to help. I was, it was the right time in the right place. And I got looped in to be part of the executive committee. Um, and that was such a wonderful experience because I was able to work with individuals outside of the library. There were a couple of faculty members, somebody from the admissions office, um, I believe the office of the registrar. I'm not remembering all the, all the offices, but there were lots of folks outside of the library. And so my role was to represent the library. And it was such a great initiative because UNCG was realizing that we're having a higher number of Latino, Latina students enrolled and some of their needs weren't being met. And so this group would work on that. So that included leading tours in Spanish, translating some university materials into Spanish as well, hosting author events, um, um, I think we even had an exhibit at LMU. I mean, I'm sorry, at LMU, at the library. We even had an exhibit for Alanza in the library. Um, so it was it was such a fast pace, such a quickly growing group um, with a lot of initiatives starting to set in. And from what I know, it still exists. And I actually still keep in touch with many of those folks that were the original um, executive committee. Um, it was such a strong bond that we were able to create. I'm in such a fun experience. Um, so I really am appreciative of, of the opportunity to do that. Um, another thing I worked on on my last year was the social media committee. I wonder if it's even in existence now, but at the time there was no social media committee in departments. You know, everyone was doing their own thing and this was a, a committee to gather people and everyone across departments could chat and talk about um, what they were doing, what the strategies for outreach would be. And we actually formed a, a formal social media policy. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, that was something that was a need in the library and I was able to be a part of that and take leadership in that. That's great. It's kind of funny to hear that, like how things have changed over time, but it also sounds like you ended up here at a really good time for both you and for us. So. <laughs> So that's great. Um, so tell us a little bit, what, what attracted you to apply to be a diversity resident at UNCG to begin with? Yeah, there, there were several things. Um, I had worked as a student worker and then a graduate assistant my last year for five years at Florida State. So um, I, um, I felt that I did have a lot of exposure and experience, but of course, graduating, I didn't have formal a formal position. Um, and so, as many of you may know, being a recent grad from library school, finding an entry level position can be a little bit more difficult. Um, or the ones that are phrased for entry level, there tends to be a lot of candidates for them. And so, one thing that did attract me about the residency was that it was designated for post MLIS, someone who recently graduated, and it's helping someone explore academic librarianship. So that really attracted me that, you know, I, I felt like I had a chance 
um, as an applicant. And again, the focus was on academic librarianship. And I was pretty certain at that time that I wanted to continue or pursue a career in academic librarianship. Um, the third thing that really attracted me was the diversity component. Um, so in the job description, there was, you know, wording on retaining and recruiting um, diverse librarians. So, you know, thinking of diversity within the library profession, um, but it also mentioned serving diverse communities in UNCG, and that was also attractive. So not only are you interested in retaining um, diverse staff, but you also want to serve these diverse communities. And I actually, um, the residency came to my attention through the Spectrum program. Um, Gwendolyn was a director at the time and she was, you know, she mentioned diversity residencies and it just happened that the UNCG, um, um, you all were looking at that time when I applied. Um, so it just, again, it also kind of just really fell into, into place at the right time. And I'll just confess, I was so, out of all the positions I had applied to, I like really wanted the diversity residency program. It just seemed for me to be the perfect fit. And I was really excited when I got the interview and even more excited when, when I was selected as a candidate. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. I'm gonna um, turn it back over to Gerald. I think he's gonna ask the next okay. question. Natalie, what advice would you give to a library interested in attracting a more diverse staff and faculty? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, um, I think, worthy of a one hour session, right? I think this is something that we've talked about for a really long time in our profession. And I think within these last couple of years, many issues have come forward and we've been thinking about it more critically. Um, and I think what I have seen from others who are more experts in, in the subject and heard from them and read in the literature, um, I think the first step is really just um, libraries and institution, institutions reflecting on their values. So really thinking and to do this continuously, right? Um, not just now during this like political and social unrest, like we should always be taking the time to just take a step back and reflect what are our values? Um, what is it that's important for us? Um, thinking about our strategic plan and what do we wanna to do to move forward? So, so then thinking about, okay, we've established our values, we know what these are, and then making these, putting these commitments into action, right? So we may have a diversity statement on our webpage now, um, but what are our actions showing towards this diversity statement, right? So, so the first step was to reflect, create this diversity statement, and then the next step is to commit to it and put it into action. And I know it's easier said than done, um, um, but I think just being very cognizant and, and, and mindful of that will, will push us forward into, into attracting um, librarians of color. And then for sure, once we have this reflection and commitment, um, you're gonna, and this comes for library administration, you're gonna have to put money into what you say is valuable. So if you discover that there is a gap or if there's something that your institution is quite not getting right, is it gonna take professional development? Is it gonna take training? Is it gonna take hiring or doing uh, moving resources around? That's gonna take money and there has to be commitment, financial commitment for that, right? Um, and I think the last thing I would say is just allow room for innovation. So when you're an institution that allows your staff to innovate, to bring different perspectives, to try new things, to fail, but then try again, you really create an inclusive environment. So you're bringing in new ideas, um, you're allowing for different perspectives. So you're not only innovating, but you're also creating an inclusive environment. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I think, I know we here at, at my own home institution, you know, we're always thinking about this. We've, we've have, um, 
several positions open now. So we really thought hard about how, what is the best way, you know, to, to attract um, a diverse staff. And um, there's very concrete strategies you can take as well when, in thinking of recruiting um, and wording you use in your job description, right? But I think kind of this higher level is just really reflecting on your values and, and putting them into action. Thank you very much. And, and true, you have been there since 2014. So my next question here, what advice would you give to a library interested in retaining a more diverse staff and faculty? Yeah, and it's, um, it's funny because I, I was at a presentation talking about the residency program and I remember it was Chapel Hill, but I don't remember what the conference was. And someone in the audience asked me exactly that question. And they framed it as, you're speaking so highly of your time at Florida State. You're speaking so highly now of your time at UNCG. Like, what is it that these institutions are doing that, you know, are making you, um, you know, happy in your position and, you know, could, could retain you? And I was just like sweating kind of a little bit. I was like, oh, how am I going to respond to this? And, you know, in a, in a good, in a good way or a good answer. And I think at the end of the day, it's just realize, realizing that there's no magic bullet. Um, you know, th there's going to be differences of experiences and perspectives. And, um, and so I think there's not one size fits all necessarily, but there are some things that um, libraries and, and, and universities can try to do to retain um, their staff and, and particularly their librarians of color. Um, and I think at the end of the day, what I came up with, my answer for that question was, is that um, at these two places, I have felt that I was listened to and I felt that I was respected. Um, and I felt that I had um, a lot of support in any initiative or just support in my career in general. And so I think at a very um, basic level, if we listen to our staff and their concerns and we um, 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 respect their perspectives and experiences and we support the initiatives and the leadership, um, their ideas they have, um, then that's just a really strong basis to creating um, an inclusive environment and one that people are going to want to stay in, right? Um, and then just what I have, this is very informal, just what I've heard through chatting with folks on who have unfortunately been wanting to leave their institutions. What I seem to hear quite often is that people are trying to leave a toxic environment and I feel that with library administration would have to have like this no tolerance for toxic environment, right? And I know, again, that's easier said than done, but um, when this environment is not inclusive and is not supportive, and then you have a toxic environment, um, it just leads to people wanting to leave and sometimes people wanting to even leave the profession. Um, so these are really, I think, big issues, but I think if libraries start talking about them in an honest and transparent way, then we can move forward into retaining our, our librarians of color. Thank you. I'm gonna ask another question. And I think after that, we'll have a little time if we get some questions from the audience here. Um, what would you consider key factors in making the residency program a success? Yeah. Um, so during the residency, I had the opportunity to present with other residents. Um, I was part of the residency interest group that falls under ACRL. So it was really a great way to meet other residents and just see what their experiences are like. And then, you know, just kind of talk about what's going well, what's not going well. Um, and I think some common themes that came out um, in, in, in chatting with other residents in my own experience is really having the institutional buy-in. Like I am so appreciative of everyone that helped me during my time at UNCG. And it like it just goes beyond. There was certainly over like 10 people who either pulled me in for a project or just sent me, 
shadow their work, um, their work and just shared their experience in their career or who I was able to go into the office and, and chat with. So it really does take a village <laughs> to have a successful <laughs> residency. And, um, you know, I was looking back at everyone who helped me during my time and it was such so many of you all. Um, and so I think having that institutional buy-in is so important um, because it, it allows that person to explore and, and really, you know, kind of grow in their career. Um, and then another, of course, is gonna be financial support. You're gonna have a person rotating in. And so you need, I mean, there's financial support and getting them hired and, you know, getting them settled, but then also um, financial support for professional development. So helping them attend conferences, um, helping them present at conferences as well. Um, so knowing that that opportunity is there and their financial support is really helpful um, um, as well. And then I, well, funny thing, I we had a residency at LMU and I was, um, the coordinator for a couple of years. And there was no documentation at LMU, I will say, unfortunately, the way that UNCG had. And so I reached out to Gerald at that point. I said, if you don't mind, can you can you share your handbook with me? Like, can we just chat about what were all the things that you needed to put in place to make this residency successful? And then I did the same at LMU. And so having something like a residency handbook, having documentation where people understood what a rotation is, um, who leads the rotation, um, who, what are the different roles? So um, I know it sounds a little bit more cut and dry, but having, having all of that groundwork is so important. And not only letting the residency the resident know what their what their role is, but every, letting everyone else in the library understand what the residency is and how how it's part of the strategic plan of the university. Um, and then last but not least, I've kind of mentioned this in the sense of it takes a village, but I um, there were some wonderful mentors during my time at UNCG, and I couldn't be where I was without those mentors. And I appreciate the folks that took the time to. Uh, some people met with me weekly, <laughs> others quarterly, um, and there was just a lot of time and dedication and, and helping me in my career, and I, I'm really appreciative of that, and I think it makes a really big difference um, to have a mentor, informal and formal, um, as a resident. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I don't see any questions in chat. Um, in, in true, questions or comments? I'm going to jump back in and ask you another question. So it sounds like, I mean, I, I so I, I am, I work in preservation services and I'm also um, an MLIS candidate. So I'm listening to this also as an, and, you know, somebody, that would be um, entry level into the career. So um, it sounds like that it's been a huge impact on you, but can you talk a little bit more about like, what do you think, like, do you, I guess, do you think you would have ended up where you are without having done the residency? Like, how has it impacted you in that way? I, Yes and no. Like, I do not think I would have been a business librarian at LMU if it hadn't been for the residency at, LM, at UNCG. Um, because when I was a recent grad, I just didn't have the experience for it. Like, I, I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have been competitive enough with other people applying for business librarian positions. Um, I do think my career would have been very different if I wasn't the diversity resident at UNCG. Um, so for me, it has had a huge impact on my career. Like I came in wanting to pursue business librarianship and I left with a job for business, you know, as a business librarian. So um, it definitely my career would have been something completely, <laughs> completely different. Um, I, I think actually. And, and again, I just will reinforce that having that first year to explore is like a, such a great experience. And, and I'm, I'm, I wouldn't, if you would ask me, would you do it again? I'd be like a hundred times yes. 
Um, and, you, and, and I will say, and I, I want to, um, residencies have come under and been more critically evaluated. I feel like in these last couple of years, I don't know if anybody has heard, I know if, if it, sometimes it can be outside of your um, things that you're keeping um, top of, but there's been a lot of critical evaluation of residencies and whether they are really helpful. Um, and, and some of the things are, do they really help retain librarians of color? Um, sometimes residents are, are brought into toxic environments and then they decide to leave librarianship um, or is this two-year model really helpful? Um, so, I, you know, I do want to just bring that up and say there are things to be critical of, but my personal experience was um, was very helpful and I, I would definitely do this again if I had the opportunity. Thanks, that's, that's really helpful to hear. I think as we're kind of about to embark on a, a new diversity residency or whatever, it's helpful, everything that you've said really to kind of know as a, um, library staff here, like what, what we can be doing to improve our organizational culture or how we might best support you or su support the next resident or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, but it's um, great to hear how the, it's impacted your career. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. We got a question. Oh, is there anything you wish was different about your experience, Natalie? Good question, I, Alyssa. I Very actually, I actually wish that I was able to stay the full two years. Um, I did not complete the full residency. Um, it was, it's difficult because you get to year two and you know how long it is for the interview process you know, in, in academia. And so I really struggled with when do I start job hunting and when does my time as a resident end, right? And wanting to be as strategic as possible. And that can be a little nerve wracking, I will say. It, it, year two for the residents that you have, it becomes really nerve wracking when you know your time is running up and you have to start interviewing. And, and, and um, so I actually left the residency six months early. Um, and and that was a difficult decision. I, I really wanted to say the full two years, but at the same time, I was given the opportunity for a permanent position and, you know, and what I wanted. So everybody was really supportive, of course, with that. And we're like, yes, of course, you got to do what you have to do, you know, go ahead and take the new position. Um, um, yeah. so, so I wish I wish I had six more months with you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like we wish that too. So, <laughs> so what, um, Amy's asking, what is your favorite part of your new collection development job? I know you've just been on the job for three months, but tell us a little bit about what you are liking about that new role. Oh, yeah, um, this has really, for me, been uh, it's a, a challenge, a fun challenge. But when, when, when I came into reference and instruction, um, or even being the business librarian, even though I had never been a business librarian before, um, I had such great mentors. I had Steve, I had my mentor at FSU. And so I knew what I was getting myself into, but with collection development, um, I, I feel like I'm like, oh, there's so much I don't know. The learning curve is so much higher. So right now there's a lot of um, just learning and thankfully my predecessor is still in the building. And so I'm meeting with her once a week and we're going over my jobs and responsibilities. But at LMU, we're a little behind <laughs> The, the bandwagon when it comes to open OERs. And my predecessor really got the ball rolling and we're really starting to work on promoting OER on campus. And we have some grants that the library is administrating to, to encourage faculty to, to move to open resources from the traditional textbook. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I feel like back in impact um, student savings and student retention. And so I'm really excited to work on something that it will have such a big impact on the university. So, so that has been, I know it's not necessarily collection development, um, but um, here at LMU, it falls under my job responsibility. 
Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. <laughs> Natalie has some photos to share with us, but definitely if we have any have more questions, please share them. I was also thinking of all the restaurants that I miss in Greensboro. I know there was that good coffee shop right down the street. The best hummus ever. I don't even know the name of the Mediterranean restaurant, um, but there's this Mediterranean restaurant. And I, I remember asking, how is your hummus this delicious? And he said, grandma makes it. And I was like, of course. Um, so it's like, miss those restaurants. Um, the fall leaves. There's no seasons in LA. Um, so definitely miss the fall foliage. Yeah, I used to live in LA and I used to say that there was two weeks of rain. That's the sea, that's the other season, if you have that, or the what are the the Santa oh. Ana winds? Oh, the yeah. Santa Ana winds. We've been in a drought, so I have not even gotten the two weeks of rain season. Oh no. Um, it looks like Anna has a question. Anna, if you want to just unmute. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Natalie. It's really good to see you. Um, and it's been great to hear about some of your experiences uh, at UNCG. We, we, like I said in the chat, we really enjoyed working with you. And one of the things that you did a really good job with when you were with us is um, sort of getting into like presentations and, and things like that. And I know you did a session at, at NCLA that I can remember with uh, me and Mary Crowder and Beth Filer Williams. And I'm wondering if that's something that you, like, I, I've, I'm not sure if you're um, tenure track or tenured or if that's a, a responsibility that you continue to have um, in your new role and how you may be uh, working on professional scholarship and presentations and things like that. I'm curious to hear what you're up to. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so um, at, at LMU, we are library staff. We're kind of this in between. We're not quite staff, but we're not quite faculty either. Um, so we do have a promotion plan that aligns with faculty, um, but we don't have tenure here at LMU. Um, so it is, at first it seemed a little, you know, I wasn't familiar with that. I came from two R1 institutions where there were tenure tracks. And so it, it seemed a little, you know, the unknown, but I do think it's a little bit the best of the both worlds where professional development is strongly encouraged. And yet you don't necessarily have to worry about getting tenure. Um, um, so, so, you know, having that professional development opportunities at UNCG was great because it got me started in, 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 in the introduction. Um, and then afterwards here at LMU, um, I've been, we did some curriculum, map, curriculum mapping for information literacy in the business curriculum. So I've been, had the opportunity to, to do that. I also got into a committee about evaluating um, predatory journals and had a lot of opportunities to present on um, the tool we created. Um, so there was a lot of opportunity to, to attend different conferences and, and write an article about that. And I've continued to collaborate with Gerald and, um, and, and Kathy Bradshaw and other residents just to continue to talk about my experience at UNCG and continue to talk about diversity residencies in general. Um, so, so yeah, I've, and now I'm just again in the middle of a brand new collection development and just right now trying to learn as much as possible, but also starting to think, okay, um, um, when it comes time to start contributing to the profession, um, what areas do I wanna focus on? That's awesome. Thank you. And I, I'm working on a professional development session for uh, faculty right now about predatory journals. So I'm going to go look for um, look for what you published. Yeah, it was just called a journal evaluation tool. I'll put it into the chat and you can, awesome. if you look Thanks. it up, it'll come up. Yep. <laughs> Are there any other questions? questions? Yeah. Natalie, you want to share your photos? Oh, I was mentioning earlier that I was going down memory lane, um, seeing everybody's names and whatnot. And then 
going through and looking at all the photos also. Oh, let me, I think it, let me swap it. There you go. Um, so so the top right, that, that's what Gerald mentioned. Um, right. That was at JCLC and so uh, the three residents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's gonna have to be an opportunity where you get all of us together at this what? point. Um, I think it's been six residents at this point. That's right, six. Mm -hmm. You're right. That would be great. Um, and I believe uh, like the bottom one was um, the ceremony or kind of the, the goodbye for the resident. Um, so it was nice to, to have the library there and, and support the ending of the program. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I see you with Chancellor Brady. Yes. Very I good. think you all have a new chancellor, correct? That's, we sure do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the folks at the bottom, that was the original executive committee for uh, Alianza. I believe some folks have left UNCG since then, um, but I'm still in touch with like Katia, who's on the far left, and she said they're still going strong. Um, the initiatives, it has only grown, and some of the um, first initiatives that we started are, are still happening now, so it's it's exciting to hear that. Yes, that's Rachel. <laughs> hey, Natalie, Katja just recently left UNCG, so that's a, a bummer. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, yeah, yeah she them. left in um, June. I want to say where I'm gonna I always re, we always reach out through her email but I actually do think I have her number um so I may need to text her you should yes we we miss her a lot so Aww. yeah yeah well I any further, any more questions? Natalie, I don't know if you know this, but Rachel is a librarian here now. You may, you may know that. Um, Rachel. No, I don't know. Rachel so. Olson. Yep. So. We got her convinced to go to library school and uh, now she's here. So it's pretty exciting. Oh, that is very exciting. Congratulations to her. I just sent her a screenshot. Of <laughs> a picture. I don't even remember what the event was, honestly. Uh, yeah, I was wondering. I know Rachel was really, cause she was um, the chair or the president of the student library mm. in group right slack i think is what it was but um because we had stickers on and so, so there's yeah. something going on but don't yeah. quite remember well natalie we certainly appreciate your time and thank you so much for answering the questions and helping us kind of figure out what what we can do to make the program even more successful and again it's just it's good to hear that it has had such a positive impact for you so yes yes thank you so much for having me it's been great to go down memory lane and see some familiar faces um so yeah anytime anytime definitely we want to thank everybody for joining us today too this has been wonderful yes yeah thanks so much everyone for joining us thanks especially to natalie for um for joining us from from so far away, but <laughs> so close. Um, we will have the recording. I will have the recording of this up on the ULVLC LibGuide for those who might be looking for it later, or if you know folks who um, ended up not being able to attend, let them know to look for it there. And with that, I will wrap things up. So thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you, Gerald and Suzanne, um, for running this great conversation. Um, and thanks again to all of our awesome participants who came today thank you very Bye, much Jeannie, and thank you natalie